and welcome back to another lecture of Statistics 568, Design and Analysis of Experiments. Today, things are not normal. We're going to be dealing with data that no longer follows the normal distribution. Get ready for that. So, so far in this course, and in every, almost every course you're going to take, in a statistics program, you're going to assume that your data has a normal distribution. They've been doing it for years, almost a century now. But very often in practice, the data you collect does not have a normal distribution, sometimes explicitly so. In the case of counts data, that is, if you just have integers, it's definitely not normal. If you have percentages, numbers that are bounded between 0 and 1, definitely not normal. So as a result, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to come up with new methods that we can use for testing whether or not our data is normal. And if it's not normal, then we're going to have to figure out new ways of analyzing that data. We're going to do two methods. We're going to try to transform our data to make it look more normal. And if that doesn't work, we can always use the generalized linear model. In past versions of this course, the generalized linear model is something that I have ignored, mainly because we teach it in just about every statistics class in this department, including undergrad regression, graduate regression, discrete data. I think they might do it in statistical consulting. So it happens a lot in this core, in this uh, department. But since we have a little bit of extra time, I thought let's look at specific examples of designed experiments with non-normal data and how we can handle that. This will be a two-part lecture. So let's go back and get into the first part. And welcome back to another lecture of Statistics 568, Design and Analysis of Experiments. Today we're going to be looking at non-normal data because very often when we're working with, well, data that we're collecting, we assume or we want to be able to assume that the data is normal because basically everything we've done in this course so far, we assume that our response variable is going to have a normal distribution, or that is, the errors in the model will have a normal distribution, which will then transfer into the response variable. But in the real world, that doesn't always happen. You could have data that's slightly skewed, maybe doesn't quite look normal. You could also have data that's blatantly not normal, like if you're counting if your response are integer counts. So rather than having a nice continuous measurement output, like say a person's blood pressure, you might have discrete counts that come out like the number of, I don't know, the uh, I guess the example that we have in the agricultural data set or the, the number of worms on a given plant, right? Because we want to get rid of them and see which pesticide is the most effective. So in that case, you actually have discrete counts, and it's not going to look normal. You could also have a percentage, a number between 0 and 1, that's going to be your response variable. These are all different things that can happen, and you can't just analyze them using the standard AOV function in R, because that's going to assume that we have normal data. So then the question is, well, what in the world do we do if our data is not normal? And there's really... I guess, two approaches that come to mind. The first is that we could try to transform our data to make it look more normal and then hope that the central limit theorem kind of takes over because ultimately we're looking at sample means, we're not looking at the data itself. And a sample mean is an average of a bunch of noisy data points. And if we average a bunch of noisy data points, then the central limit theorem is telling us that if we average enough noisy data points, it's going to look like it has a normal distribution, even if each individual data point does not have a normal distribution. So if our data isn't too far from normal and we have a large enough data size, we're probably okay. So oftentimes we'll try to try to transform our data to make it look a little more normal. 
but that's not always easy to do. Another thing we could do is we could use a generalized linear model. This is a topic that in past versions of this course I haven't covered, mainly because it's covered in so many other courses in our department, including undergrad regression, the graduate regression course. I think they might do it in um, discrete data when you talk about Poisson distributions, for example. Um, so it's covered a lot of different places, but since we have a little bit of extra time this year, I thought we could focus in and talk about the generalized linear model specifically for design of experiments. And what this is going to do is it's going to be like our usual linear model, but we're going to take out the uh, sum of squares or the, um, the normal distribution and the things that come with it, like the F test and whatnot, and we're going to replace it with another distribution, like a binomial or a Poisson or some other um, type of distribution of interest. And what it means is that we don't have the usual test statistics that we're used to, but we can do a lot with likelihoods because we still have a parametric distribution and that means we have access to the idea of a likelihood and we can do a lot of the same things that we were doing before in terms of likelihood. So if we're looking for model fitting, if we want to see which terms are the most significant, and we're going to do some examples of data um, to look into that a little bit more um, in detail. Now, that'll either be at the end of today's lecture or in the next lecture, depending on how much time we spend going through the theory and the uh, mathematical setup for the generalized linear model. But uh, rest assured, we will have some examples either now or in the, uh, the next one. But for now, we have to first talk about transformations. How do we transform our data to make it look more normal? And that's what we're going to start with in today's lecture. So let's get into the notes. All right, so today's lecture is on non-normal data. And as I mentioned, the first topic is going to be the idea of transforming to get, I'll say, more normal looking data. Because, okay, we're not going to have exactly a normal distribution if we have something else we're starting with and we transform it, but we can at least get close. Now, there are different ways that we can do transformation. And by the way, if you're like, if you were looking at my online lecture notes, I'm getting a lot of these notes from my lecture notes from Statistics 378, um, Applied Regression Analysis that I taught for a couple years to the undergrads. Um, so I'm just going to quickly talk about some of the topics in that course, but adapt them specifically to our area of interest, which is design of experiments. Anyway, um, what we want to do, so the idea is to replace y i with some, let's say, y i prime, where y i prime is some function of y i. So examples, there's a couple really common examples that we would see. The first is a square root transformation. We could, for example, just take the square root of our data point and that might make things look more normal. Um, or we could take a log transform if we have positive values. We did this way back at the beginning of the course, if you remember, when we looked at that rabbit data. So we looked at that data of blood pressure taken from rabbits and we found that it did not have homogeneous variances when we used, I think, Bartlett's test to test that. So what we did was we took a log transform of the data. The variances still weren't really homogeneous, but they were, let's say, more homogeneous or less heterogeneous than they were before prior to the transform. So again, there's a there's two sides to transforming your data. The first is that there's a bit of an art to it where you can kind of just look at the data that you have and try to think of a good way to transform it to make it look more normal. Typically, the um, we could do this visually. 
this is the art side of it where we're kind of visually and intuitively trying to figure out what the right transformation is. Visually, we might have something that looks like maybe this. If we had a box plot, say, that line is not in the center. Oh, I lost my box. So maybe, let me see if I can actually circle this thing. Is that going to work? That is not going to work at all. There we go. And then maybe we have some outliers. Um, what I'm trying to do is draw a box plot with some like outliers uh, that's obviously has some positive skewness to it. So if this is, say, our factor or category and this is the response Y, then after transformation, what we might get is something that looks a little bit more symmetric. This is a very hand wavy way I'm explaining this, but it is um, a reasonable thing to try. That if you start with something on the left that looks skewed, and then it's, let's say it's positive, so we apply a log transform, and then we get something that's maybe not skewed. Maybe we still have an outlier or two. It's okay to have, you know, a little guys out there. Um, Right, that would be one way to identify that, oh, it looks like we've got a good transformation. Um, we can also use tools like Bartlett's test. So Bartlett's test is not going to tell us if our data looks normal. It's going to tell us if our categories appear to have homogeneous variances. Um, so beyond just being non-normal, we also might have normal data with inhomogeneous variances and then applying a transformation like a log transform can at times improve uh, the look of our data. Um, we can use tools like Bartlett's test to check the transformed data for variance homogeneity. We can also use, we can also use tests for normality, which there are dozens of out there. Um, the uh, most common ones are the uh, Kamolkarov Smirnov test. So, Kamolkarov Smirnov, Smirnov, which somebody really needs to come up with like a vodka brand that has the label Kamolkarov Smirnov on it, because that would just be amazing. Um, there's one called Anderson Darling. They always seem to come with two names, right? There's a Shapiro Wilkes. There's a whole bunch of other ones. I think there's like a Kramer von Mises one as well. Um, there's way too many tests for normality. Kramer von Mises. Um, right, so we've got tons and more, I should say, just because there's probably other ones out there and many more. I would not expect you to like actually take data and run it through every single test for normality, but each of these tests will have a different test statistic that will be trying to compare the way your data looks to the normal distribution. In the case of the Kamolkarov smirnov statistic, it uses a supremum. So it looks at the max difference, whereas Anderson-Darling is a weighted squared difference. I forget what the other ones are. I think Kramer von Mises might be an unweighted squared difference. Um, when I say squared difference, I mean in a Euclidean sense. Um, but 
Yeah, I'd have to look up the formula for the rest of these. But roughly the idea is that they're all going to be looking at slightly different test statistics to see how your data lines up with the normal distribution. And you could apply these uh, to a given category. Now, it is important that you would apply them within one category of your data because if you combine your entire data set, you could have two different categories with two different means and then your data is not going to look normal at all because it's going to be bimodal. That would be great for a design of experiments if you have two categories whose distributions are separated enough that it looks bimodal, right? Um, but uh, yeah, basically there's lots of ways you can test for normality and all of these exist in R. Now, what I did want to talk about though is that there is a slightly more scientific or uh, way rather than like the art way of of trying to transform your data which is really just feeling like okay what's my data look like how should i transform it do i need to just pick some things try them out see what my data looks like after i transform it instead there's actually a, a one method that will kind of automate it for you and that's called the box cox method so that's the next thing i want to talk about the box cox method two famous statisticians who get their names attached to a lot of different things um, this is also sometimes referred to as the power transform and the idea of the box cox method is that we're going to take our response variable y i and we are going to change it into a y i with some lambda which i didn't explain what that is yet but what this thing is going to be is it's going to be well y i lambda minus one over lambda which okay it's just kind of the fancy way to say we're taking y to the lambda power and there's a couple little weird transformation things they do here um, you can't put lambda equal to zero into that formula or else you're going to get zero over zero but in the limit you end up with a log transform so the idea here is is that first of all um, we require yi to be positive or else these things may not work if lambda is not well if lambda is say not an integer like if you're doing a square root transform you can't do that to a negative number at least in stats world where we want our response to not be a complex number and similarly with the log transform and most a lot of these transforms we need our data to be positive valued that's often the case and we can often make that the case if we have to um, so that's a requirement and then this is for some lambda in the reals real numbers so the idea is to let the data pick lambda the data and the model and we'll do some examples of this in r where what we do is we fit a model just assuming the normal distribution and then you shove it into the box cox function and it'll tell you how it wants to transform your data based on the response variable and the model and it will pick a lambda for you and transform your data if lambda so lambda could be this could include for example like a square root transformation a log transformation and really any other type of so-called power transform i think by default the program in the the default in r will search from like minus two to plus two for the best lambda because what happens here is that we um i don't think i have the uh oh, i thought i had the graph in here that's okay we'll make a graph when we get to the r code 
ultimately what it's going to do is it's going to use a maximum likelihood type of approach to find the best lambda. So um, I'm not going to go through all of the math because it doesn't seem like it's really worth it at this point. So at this point, I'm just going to hand wave my way through it, but I'm going to say that um, roughly um, box Cox um, finds the maximum likelihood estimator for lambda as well as the model parameters I guess and sigma squared in that case the um, variance of the uh, of uh, epsilon so yeah that's more or less the idea right the idea is to write down the likelihood which is going to be something that looks like the likelihood of so we're going to have three things we're going to have beta which is going to be my vector of parameters now in this course we haven't been using the usual linear model setup of beta being my parameter vector but um, we could um, write it out that way um, in the case of um, ANOVA of course because ANOVA is just a linear model we would have sigma squared which is the variance that we'd be estimating and then lambda is this new parameter so basically what it does is it says I could do my normal maximum likelihood based on the normal distribution and without lambda but then what it does is it shoves lambda in and says I have a new parameter it's called lambda and I'm going to now maximize the likelihood for all of these things hmm actually an interesting point if we have one more parameter feasibly we would need one degree of freedom for that I didn't even think about that before doing this lecture but I guess if we are estimating another parameter in our model we might actually need another degree of freedom for that parameter kind of like with Tukey's one degree of freedom test where we that we did earlier in the course oh that'll be interesting to see how that works out when we actually do this with real R code but um Regardless, that's roughly the idea. If you want to see the maximum likelihood calculations, you can look up my um, regression notes. They're not the most interesting things to look at, so that's why I'm not really thinking it's worth spending a lot of time going into that. More so it's the intuition. The intuition is that we fit our model and we fit it to data that's not necessarily normal. We hit it with this transformation and it tries to make the data look more normal. And we'll see that when we get to that um, R code. But what we need to spend more time on is the generalized linear model because it's more complicated. In this case, it's just we transform our response variable and we just proceed as pretending we have a normal distribution. But when we uh, use a generalized linear model, we have to work with new distributions things become a little bit harder. So we're going to check out that now. All right, so we're going to be talking about the generalized linear model now. And as I said, it's really the same idea as the classic least squares linear model. But what happens here is that we have a new distribution to work with. And we can choose from a wide variety of different distributions to work with depending on our specific data. And it means that things are going to look the same in the sense that we're still going to be estimating parameters. We're still going to be getting ANOVA-like tables, but there are going to be some differences in how we interpret it and how the test statistics are computed. So I'm not going to be doing an intensive overview of the generalized linear model because, well, you could spend multiple classes. I mean, there are textbooks on generalized linear models. But for now, we're just going to do a quick overview and then see how it works in the case of um, in the case in the case of design of experiments. That and I know that there are plenty of other courses we teach that will actually go into excruciating detail on such topics. So the setup 
is simply I, we have a linear model model, but the response may not be normal. I think you can actually tell the GLM function in R, that is generalized linear model, GLM function in R, that you want to use a normal distribution. I think it does the same thing then as the linear model, except that maybe it uses maximum likelihood based approach then, um, I mean, it's the same thing, I guess, as least squares, but you can get some different test statistics out if you do like a chi-squared test rather than an F test. But um, anyway, uh, yeah, so the idea is that our, the setup is we have a linear model, but our response may not be normal. So we um, basically get that we have some function g of the expected value of y, maybe I should use different brackets here, is a linear function of our response or our um, predictor or input variables. So I'm writing this out in the case of just a linear regression with beta x1 through xp but we could write this out instead using the notation we did before as something like, um, I don't know, mu naught plus uh, maybe like treatment one i plus treatment two j plus whatever block k etc something like that right where we can we could plug in our treatment and our block and our other factors into this model they're all still linear models it's just a lot easier for me to write it like this in terms of just a linear regression model rather than try to keep track of all the different factors and indices i j k l etc that's right i never really used k because k was normally the number of treatment or um, factor levels but regardless what is going on on the left hand side because the right hand side of this equation is just what we have before it's a linear model the left hand side looks a little weird so here what we have is we have the mean response and I should probably say condition this on x, the inputs. This would be like saying conditioning it on the category that it's in, the treatments and the whatever factors applied. And there's something g here. So g is going to be called a link function. And the link function is basically a way to make the to make the response linearly related to the inputs and we're taking the expected value because we want to model the mean of the responses and it doesn't really work to just have a plus epsilon because we no longer have plus iid normal noise um, so the link function is just going to be something that's going to transform our responses much like we talked about before with transformation it's just that here we're actually plugging in a specific distribution and that distribution will come with a specific link function. Now, if you've studied GLMs or if you've looked at the code in R, you'll know that there are different choices for link functions based on the distribution you choose. You can actually find, I think, a big table of them, I believe on uh, Wikipedia somewhere where they actually have all of the different 
or many of the different distributions and some of the links, maybe not. I'll have to keep looking it up. It doesn't really matter. The idea is that there's lots of choices, but there are default choices and we're not going to go into, again, all of the depth of what link functions you should use and how you should actually do this. We're just going to try to do a quick overview to see how this applies to our course material. Right, so I'm going to do two standard examples. Um, so example one is called logistic regression. And logistic regression is going to be where yi takes on the values of 0 or 1, or yi is in the interval, the closed interval is 0 to 1. So in this case, you could have, for example, like a recovered versus not recovered. I mean, in some sense, we've dealt with a lot of binary variables, but so far in this course, the binary variables have been inputs apply treatment or don't apply treatment versus a response, right? So you could imagine that you have some study where you're giving different types of medications to people. Um, maybe you're testing cancer drugs, for example, and you're testing, you know, different drugs, different combinations of drugs with different binary factors of a person's age and other things like that that you want to plug into some model. And now the response variable is going to be, did they recover or not? Is the, let's say, did they recover from their cancer or are they still sick? And there we would have a binary response, zero or one. Now, over here, we can have a continuum of responses from zero to one. So this could be, um, well, it could be a lot of things. I think in the example that I found in the agricultural data set library or package in R is um, the amount of like spots on a leaf. So it's some fraction of the whole. But you could imagine a lot of other things coming, taking values strictly between zero and one. So this could be like basically percentages. Maybe your response, maybe your, let's forget about... Um, medicine and agriculture, maybe you're doing, um, you're looking into um, voters in politics. And now your response variable is the, uh, let's say the percent of voters in a given region who vote for the liberal party, say in Canada, and you have different, um, I guess, variables that could um, like, you know, go in. I guess in this case, it's a little bit harder to imagine treatments because we're not actually like giving people drugs and saying, do they want to vote for liberals or conservatives now? Um, but roughly, you can get the idea that these are all different types of responses you might see in practice. And in both of these cases, we can use something called logistic regression to model this. So in this case, um, well, for 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 y i taking values in zero to one, we can use the Bernoulli slash binomial distribution. And what we're going to be modeling in this case is that, the um, expected value of yi given the treatments, the inputs x, is going to be the probability that yi is equal to 1 given the treatments x. So again, if we're considering this case of recovered, not recovered, what we're saying is, is given these treatments and maybe block factors or whatever, given this, what's the probability? Probab 
I can't even recover that probability, whatever, close enough uh, of recovery. And in this case, it's called the logistic regression because the link function, that G that I put up there is going to be the logistic function which looks like an S curve. It kind of starts off low and then it shoots up and then it tapers off again. I'll draw a picture of it in a second. Um, but what we're going to do is just for notation's sake, we're going to call this thing, we're going to call pi i, just so that I have some, I don't have to keep writing expected value of y given x, etc. cetera. Um, so here, the link, function is the logistic, I guess, function, which again, as I kind of noted, is going to look something like this. So it's going to start, it's, I mean, it's going to go on forever, but it's going to start off at zero and then it's going to kind of go up, 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 and then it's going to taper off at one. The little dots in there. So the logistic function is going to look something like that. It will also extend off to minus infinity here. And it's mathematically, it's going to look something like pi i is equal to in the exponent a, I'm just going to write x i transpose beta to say that we're doing a dot product between my inputs and my parameters. And then in the denominator, we have one plus the exponent. So I'm not, again, I'm not, for the sake of this course and the fact that we're almost done with it, I'm not so concerned that you know exactly what like the logistic function is. But in the case that you enjoy looking at mathematical functions, I, I know I do, um, it's good to just see kind of what's going on here. Um, but visually, what we're doing is we are transforming our linear input, the linear combination of inputs using the logistic function, which is going to give us something that looks like an S curve. Now, if we were to invert that, actually, what we end up with is something that looks like the log of pi i over 1 minus pi i is a linear combination of the x's and the betas. And this is actually quite interesting because this thing in here is the odds ratio. And this entire thing is called the log odds. So odds ratio is best explained if you're betting on something, right? If you say I got two to one odds on whatever, you know, horse winning the horse race, then that means that if I were to bet, say, um, $1 on that horse, I should win two back. Um, and that's really what the odds are. So if the odds are one to one, that means pi in this case is one half. And it's a fair bet in the sense that it's equal, it's like a coin flip, basically. If the odds are two to one, or three to one, or a hundred to one, the best way to think of that is how much money should I win if I were to wager a dollar on such a bet? Mathematically, it's gonna look like pi i divided by one minus pi i. So again, we're taking our response variable and we're transforming it, and we're actually, what we're doing is we're fitting a linear model to the log odds. So it does have a very, Again, when I write down logistic function, it's like, well, what in the world does that mean? It actually has a nice interpretation, which is basically that the log odds is linearly related to our inputs, inputs. So we have some inputs to our model, and we're trying to model the log odds as a linear function. So that's roughly what logistic regression is doing. There are lots of different little knobs and dials that you can tweak if you want to use something other than the logistic function. But for now, we're just going to stick with this uh, of the most simple 
uh, set up for logistic regression here. And yes, yeah, so we can skip a lot of the details that I don't really want to get into, but I did want to talk about what you're going to see when you try to fit one of these models. Because when you try to fit one of these models, you're going to get a lot of the same, you're going to get an ANOVA table, but it's not going to be the ANOVA table that we're used to. So let's say if I were to fit such a model, Yeah, let's use we, the royal we, if we were to fit such a model, right? Let's all do it together. If we were to fit such a model, um, we can't use F tests um, because those are very contingent on the idea that our data has a normal distribution. So the entire ANOVA table was based on sums of squares and F statistics and F tests, and we can't do that now. So what do we do? Well, what we end up doing is we end up decomposing the likelihood. So instead, instead we use the log likelihood in the, I'm going to say ANOVA table in quotes, and something called the deviance, <laughs> just a peculiar terminology. Right, so what are we doing? Well, you're going to see things like null terms like null deviance, residual deviance. So instead of basically, instead of residual sum of squares, so in, in basically for the normal distribution, we had the residual or the air, residual or the air sum of squares. We can't do that anymore. Um, as a side note, if I had my data here, let's say my normal data, right? What's the sum of squares? It's really just looking at the distance of all of my data points, that is the residuals, um, the distance of my data points to the least squares fit line. Now, what it tells me is that if I take all these values and I square them and I sum them, that's my residual sum of squares. And it tells us kind of how much the model is not telling us or how much variation is unexplained by the model that we're fitting. And that makes sense. But if I had a logistic regression model. I might have a curve that looks like this, and I have a bunch of data points that might be like here, 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 and here, and then maybe some up here. So the normal notion of residual does not work in generalized linear models. There are lots of, and there's more than one, there's a ton of different types of residuals that you can compute. There's Pearson residuals, there's, I think, deviance residuals, and there's uh, probably a whole bunch of others that I'm forgetting their names of. So the idea is that over here, this kind of works. Uh, this uh, is not good. So instead of doing that, what we do for, say, GLMs, like logistic regression. I don't think there's two G's in regression, but ah, my handwriting makes it one continuous line. Anyway, um, yeah, so in this case, what you will see is the idea of a residual 
deviants. And what that basically is, is what I'm going to write that down here. So the residual, how many times can I write residual deviance in one lecture? The residual deviance is going to look like a log likelihood ratio. It's going to be minus two for scaling purposes times the log of the likelihood of the fitted model to something called the saturated model. So in this case, right, if we have a model, a linear model, we can, we have we have a distribution. It might be a binomial distribution. It might be a Poisson distribution. It could be a normal distribution, but then we would just do sum of squares. Um, we can get a likelihood out for the fit of that model, but likelihood on its own doesn't really mean anything. It's just a number. Um, it's not unlike the sum of squares. It's like, but in this case, it's just the fact that if I have the likelihood for a fitted model, it could be like 17. Okay, great. What, what in the world does that mean? In this case, what we do is we want the log likelihood ratio between the likelihood for the fitted model and the likelihood for the saturated model. So here, the fitted model is literally just the model we fit to the data. Whereas the saturated model, the set model, is going to be a model with, well, I'll just say as many parameters as possible. The idea being that if I have n data points, then if I put n minus one parameters into that model, I can fit the data exactly. And that's what the saturated model does. It says, okay, what's the likelihood if I just put in all the possible parameters to perfectly fit the data? Now, we wouldn't want to do that in practice. That's a terrible way to fit a model. But what we're going to use that as our denominator here to kind of standardize everything so that we have some standardization for our log likelihood ratio, right? It's a ratio, we need a denominator. The denominator is gonna be our saturated model. All right, and then the idea is that we have something, well, remember in the case of, um, in the case of the sum of squares, we have our F statistic with our F distribution. We don't have an F distribution here. We technically don't have, well, a good distribution, uh, but asymptotically, asymptotically we do, asymptotically this thing, this minus two times the log likelihood ratio is going to be chi-squared. And that's something called Wilkes's theorem. All right, so the distribution of the log likelihood ratio is not F, <laughs> like the ratio of sums of squares. So instead, we have something called Wilkes's theorem. And Wilkes's theorem is a great tool in statistics. It basically says um, for two models, or for two parameter spaces, that are nested, so we have theta naught contained in theta one. This basically just means my one model will have some parameters in it and my other model will have 
those and more parameters in it. So as long as the parameter spaces are nested, it means that we can't compare non-nested models using this approach. Um, but that's okay. We can still get away with what we need to do. Um, so for those two parameter spaces, um, well, I think then, <laughs> oh, okay, now I have it all in here. Then what we have is that minus two times the log of the likelihood ratio, which in this case is minus two times the log of the ratio where what I'm doing is I'm maximizing the likelihood. So soup, this notation is really just saying maximize the likelihood over parameter space zero. And in the denominator, we maximize the likelihood over parameter space one. And so that's all, like I said, in case you haven't, you're not familiar with the notation of supremum, this is basically just max the likelihood over theta zero or theta one. And the claim of Wilkes' theorem, which we're not going to be proving in this course, is that this thing converges in distribution to a chi-squared, where the degrees of freedom p, where p is the difference in the dimensions of the parameter spaces. Cool, so that's roughly the idea. The idea is that asymptotically, the log likelihood ratio properly scaled by a factor of minus two is going to have a chi-squared distribution. And that means we can do some hypothesis testing for generalized linear models in the same style as we did for the normal distribution. It's just that in this case, we're going to use a chi-squared test and we have to just be aware of the fact that this is only asymptotically true um, and not, um, not a, an exact thing. Whereas the F statistic was exact, assuming the errors in our model were IID normal. If they weren't, then technically the F statistic is wrong as well. But uh, yeah. Anyway. Oh yeah, we're actually making some good time here. So that's roughly what you'd what you'd expect. Now, um, the same type of degrees of freedom is going to come out as we saw before, right? Because if my fitted model is L, where the the fitted model would be um, theta naught here, which would have all the parameters that I need to fit my model, which is all the degrees of freedom for the treatments and the blocks and everything else. And everything that's left over is going to be the data size minus one minus the number of parameters in my model, which is going to be my residual degrees of freedom. So that's all. Um, it's going to look very similar to what we had before. And we'll see that when we actually look at the R code. But yeah, for now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about another example that is very, very common in practice. And this is the Poisson regression. So the Poisson regression, it's the same idea in some sense as the logistic regression. In this case, we assume yi given x has a Poisson distribution. So that's kind of makes sense, right? With um, some parameter, which I'm not going to specify yet. That is, we're trying to figure out how the parameter, the rate of the Poisson distribution uh, changes as x, our inputs, change. And again, Poisson, so Poisson is used to model counting responses. 
like I said, the example that we had, it, we, we will look at in the agricultural data sets is the number of worms crawling around on some leaves. No, you're not going to have some fraction of them. I mean, unless a bird attacks them, but we're not going to have a fraction of them. We're just going to have, you know, a, a discrete integer count. And typically this won't necessarily, well, it won't necessarily look normal. Um, there are ways to transform the Poisson distribution to make it look more normal, but we're not going to do that at the moment. Right, so this is counting responses and um, and the model is going to look like the log of the expected value of y i given x i is a linear combination, we'll just say xi transpose beta. So in this case, the link function is a log. Link is log. I think there were those old toys, Lincoln logs, that you could use to make little log cabins. Good stuff. Anyway, in this case, the default, I should say the default link function is the log logarithm. You can do other link functions. Again, I'm not going to get into the details of why we might choose one over the other, but the default one is the one we'll stick with, which is to take a log transform of your data. Right, so Roughly, there's not much more to say than that. <laughs> um, what we would do, and then I guess I should say one thing, which is that note that um, all GLMs are fit via maximum likelihood. So in my in my regression theory notes, I write down the likelihood based on the Poisson distribution and say, ah, we can maximize it. But of course, we can't do that. A computer can do that because there's no good closed form solution. So yeah, we're not going to maximize the likelihood. But luckily, computers know how to do that using various numerical solving techniques to maximize the likelihood. Um, there is something interesting about the Poisson distribution. So besides just the fact that, okay, we're going to model the, um, I should say that uh, this is the rate function lambda i, which is the rate. Lambda is kind of being overused here in this lecture, but typically in the Poisson distribution, the single parameter is going to be lambda, which is going to be the rate function. And we're saying that the log of the rate is going to be a linear combination of my predictor variables. Okay, um, other things about the Poisson distribution. Sometimes um, we will instead transform yi to the square root of yi and use the normal distribution. When you have counting data, Poisson counting data, it's not uncommon to see people do a square root transform of the data and to proceed that way. Now, we can, we're going to try that to see how it, what it tells us about our data and if it gives us a good fit or not. Um, but this is just another approach to the Poisson distribution. And if you want to know more about this, you can look up variance stabilizing transformations, which I'm not going to cover here, but just to indicate that sometimes people will just transform the Poisson distribution and say, okay, now it's normal enough. We'll just do normal distribution. Um, or you can just use a generalized linear model, which is also a very nice thing to do. And because we have computers now, we don't have to worry so much about transformations, right? If you didn't have a computer, you don't want to fit a GLM because it's super annoying to maximize the likelihood. Whereas 
solving a system of a, a linear system of equations to with the normal distribution is well still not fun to do by hand but at least it's more doable by hand anyway there's one more thing that i wanted to mention i don't think i even talked about this with my uh in the undergrad course but um The other thing I want to mention is that is something called dispersion for GLMs. So when using the GLM function, you can select a distribution. You can select, say, binomial for logistic regression. You can select Poisson for, <laughs> surprise, Poisson regression. Um, but these distributions are very rigid. Rigid, 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 eh, whatever. You get the idea. Um, what they're rigid in the sense that, uh, what I mean by that is we can't select a mean and variance independently as with as compared with the normal distribution So this is another issue that arises when you're fitting with a generalized linear model. If I have the normal distribution, I get a mean and I get a variance. So that's kind of trivial. It's like, well, of course you do, but it's actually subtle and very important. You can select the mean, which is the mean of your category, and then you also get the variance, how spread out your data is. For many of the generalized linear models, you can't do that. So the Poisson distribution has a single parameter, lambda. I mean, the Poisson is the easiest one to see here. So we'll do an example. Example, if Z is a Poisson random variable with rate parameter lambda, then the expected value of Z is lambda and the variance of Z is lambda. So the point is that the mean and the variance are the same. And I can't independently choose a mean and a variance if I'm fitting a Poisson distribution. That makes it extremely rigid. And it often will have trouble fitting your data because of that. And the fix, the fix is to include a dispersion parameter. And the math is annoying, so I'm not going to do it. Uh, you can definitely look this up in textbooks on generalized linear models, but I want to just explain qualitatively what's going on here so that when we look at real data, you have a sense in your mind of what's happening. So the fix is to include a dispersion parameter which allows for the variance to change independently of the mean. And in this case, what you would do is in R, you'll see the terms, instead of binomial and Poisson, you'll see quasi-binomial and quasi-Poisson.
for the, again, logistic and Poisson regressions. And it's just something good to know that if you try to fit one of these models without the quasi term, it could fit really well, and that's great. But it also might not because of this issue of the rigidity of these models. So uh, it's another good tool to use, and it's good to be aware of here. All right. Well, you know what? I don't really. Yeah, what we'll do is I'll just mention one more, a couple more things. Um, basically, there are lots of other GLMs as well. So we can generalize um, the Poisson. GLM via something called negative binomial regression. In fact, it's probably still in my now vacant office for almost a year back at the university, but I have a whole textbook called negative binomial regression. So it's a topic that's big enough that you could have a whole textbook. At least somebody thought it was worth writing an entire textbook about. So again, there's a huge depth here that I am completely glossing over because it's not really the focus of this course, but I want to just give you these little points so that you know where to look in the future. Um, like I said, we have Poisson. It's good for modeling counts data. If I need an issue, if there's a dispersion issue, I could use it. I, I, if there's a if there's a variant issue, I could use a dispersion parameter via quasi Poisson, or I could fit a more general counting process to my data using by the negative binomial regression. Now, there's a lot of other things we can do here. Right, we can also we can also use say gamma or exponential random variables. Um, there's one called inverse Gaussian regression. Inverse Gaussian regression and though that's right another good one is multinomial which is multinomial regression in this case for the final one multinomial regression this would be like having categorical responses categorical responses beyond binary. So the binomial regression or the binom using the binomial distribution in the form of logistic regression, you can get out a yes or a no response. For multinomial regression, you could have multiple different categorical responses. Um, so you could imagine some giant discrete type setting where you have a bunch of discrete factors, categorical inputs, and a categorical output to your model. Um, so there are lots of different tools that you can use here. And yeah, you can have, you know, there's textbooks on this. Um, they all have their different theory, their uses, their link functions, um, which you can find by just well searching either on a, in a textbook or on a, say Wikipedia for example because they have a lot of different examples there. Um, but in the end, I think that's all I wanted to talk about today. So this will be a slightly shorter lecture. But roughly, in a re to recap, right? We have data so far in this course. It's always been normal, but that's not what you're going to see in practice. If it's not normal. You could try to transform it. We're going to do that with some examples in the next lecture. Things like square roots and logs are really common. We can also use generalized linear models. And even though the terminology and everything is a lot scarier than what we were doing 
with our just regular linear models, ultimately the end result is going to be something that's almost the same. You're going to get an ANOVA table. You're going to have test statistics. You're going to have p-values. They're not going to be f-tests. They're going to be chi-squared tests. In fact, you can tell R that you want to do an f-test and it'll yell at you and say, that's a dumb idea because you don't have a normal distribution. But we'll find that in the next lecture. Um, but yeah, basically, that's that's the main point is that uh, you can try a lot of these, but there is a lot of deep theory and application. So if you find yourself faced with a certain type of data, if it's binary, if it's categorical, if it's counting data, then at least you now have some idea of the tools or the terminology to go investigate further to figure out the best way to analyze that specific type of data. In the next lecture, we're going to do some R code and we're going to look at both binary responses and we're going to look at um, Poisson data because those are some of the most common ones you might see in practice. And it's a lot of fun. They're in the agricultural um, data package in R and we're going to find out how all of this works in practice. But we're going to do that in the next lecture. So I will see you then.